Good day. Welcome to Bible Class Topics. We're going to add another study to our topical sermon playlist today. This one is entitled, If the Righteous is Scarcely Saved. And we take this line from 1 Peter 4, verses 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Some commentators feel Peter is talking about Proverbs 11.31 here, and perhaps quoting from the Greek Septuagint, the Greek version of, of what we call the Old Testament. If the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner. These solemn words should startle and move the ungodly and the sinner to obedience and stand as a warning to the righteous. Now when we hear the word scarcely, we right away think of the words almost or barely. But we have to understand that the word used for scarcely here is actually a word that means to accomplish with great difficulty. If our salvation is to be accomplished with great difficulty, it is best for us to make sure God is included in all of our plans. 1 Timothy 4.8 for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Further along in Peter's first epistle, chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a ro roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And then James, the Lord's brother, in his short epistle says this in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. When we become a Christian, the person that is most upset over that is the devil himself. Satan wants us to feel robbed when we give up our worldly old self to follow Christ. And speaking of following Christ, Jesus became everyone's role model when he came to earth, lived as a man, and sacrificed himself for our sins. In Proverbs 3 and verse 4, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. In Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So our passage in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18 where Peter says, If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? is the apostle Peter giving us an exhor exhortation to live a better life. Live a Christian life, but day by day improve that Christian life. In our discussion today, we want to talk about the fact that the Bible teaches us that you are not your own. We'll talk about conse consecration and steadfastness, and we'll look at a few examples from the Old Testament of some righteous people who had a hard time and through their determination were able to be saved. And I said 
some of them were able to be saved. One of our examples didn't quite make it. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And then moving over to chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. How much of our time and talent, then, do we owe to God? As Christians, we basically owe Him everything. And when we talk about everything, we don't mean just spiritually, but we mean our actual lives. What do we think when we hear Jesus make commands like Matthew 6.33 and Mark 16.15 and 16? Are we to be out there? following these commands? Are, are these commands even made to us? In Matthew 6, 33, he said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Most people won't argue with me on that one. They'll say, yes, absolutely. If we're Christians, we need to put the kingdom of God first. We need to put his righteousness first. And then live our lives based on those things and carry on from there. But Mark 16, 15 and 16, perhaps, people will say, well, he gave this charge to his apostles and first century disciples, and it really doesn't apply to us today. He told them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. You know, when I started this YouTube channel going on three years ago, I had no idea that people all over the world would watch these videos. I mostly did it for my friend Bob. He would gotten himself so ill that he couldn't come to church anymore. He couldn't come and worship with the congregation. So I thought I'd put a few lessons up so he could study at home. And now here we are with over 200 subscribers to the channel. Last month we had almost 1,600 views, I believe. So even though I did not set out to go into all the world with this YouTube channel, I have gone into all the world. It's very humbling. Thank you for subscribing. We have to remember that God comes first. His work that we need to be about comes first. His worship that we need to be about comes first. Matthew 8, 19-22 and a scribe came up and said to him, that is to Jesus, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another one of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. John 9 verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. In Acts 4, 19, Peter and John have been warned to quit preaching the gospel. But Peter and John answered them and said, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Later on, in chapter 5, verse 29, But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Let me read Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 26. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there are no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It's June 19th, 2021, as I'm recording this video. If you're watching this in the future, you know good and well we've come through, or trying to come through, a pandemic. And much of the year of 2020, we spent worshiping electronically. I know our congregation used Zoom meetings, streaming on YouTube and Facebook to continue being able to worship together. Others worshiped in the parking lots. But now, as things are winding down, Hopefully, prayerfully, Lord willing, we're starting to gather back together. But how do we treat the worship service, the Lord's Day worship service? Are we in a hurry to get the Lord's Day worship service over and done? Besides the main service, the Sunday service, the Lord's Day service, do we tend to avoid other gatherings of the church? Even at this date, we continue to meet Sunday evenings on Zoom. It has been interesting that during the pandemic, our, Zoom, our Wednesday night Zoom meeting, we were having better attendance for that than we ever had at the percentage-wise at the building. We should not be avoiding these other services. Now, if our health warrants it, then perhaps we do need to stay away a little bit longer. But for the rest of us that have been inoculated, the rest of us that are healthy, we need to get together with each other. Why? The Hebrew writer said, to stir up one another to love and good works, to be encouraging one another. Those are the kind of things that happen when we gather with one another. I've known people that, ha that make a move, either for their work or they just want to move somewhere else. And they haven't considered where they were going to worship. Others let their work keep them away from worship service. Others let their friends or their hobbies keep, keep them away from worship service. True Christianity is a radical commitment to Jesus Christ, and it's not just going to church on Sunday. Let's talk about consecration and steadfastness. Consecration is the act of setting oneself apart from the world to become dedicated as an instrument of righteousness for the purpose of God. And steadfastness is fulfilling our Christian duty in a firm and unwavering way. That brings us back to our title of our lesson today, The Righteous is Scarcely Saved. Proverbs 18.9, Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. In Hebrews 2, 2, through 2 and 3, For since the message declared by angels provided proved, I should say, to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? We already talked about people that choose not to gather with a congregation of the Lord's people. Perhaps they move to a new place with no thought of where they might worship. Perhaps they just go to the church down the street because it's handy. We've got to do better than that. And now I have friends that have moved by because of their work, forced to move into a place. And to get a congregation of the Lord's people going, they just met in their own home. There's nothing wrong with that. And it may be a necessity. But however we approach our 
worship, however we approach our work for the Lord, we understand that there's a necessity of firmness and continuance. Proverbs 24.10, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And then in Proverbs 25.26, like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. As we already read in Hebrews 10.25, there's people who are not seeing to the encouragement of their Christian brothers. And they're doing that by avoiding the services of the church. They're not meeting either online or in person with their brethren. Well, we can't lead the church because others are doing wrong. Somebody said, the church is full of hypocrites. And someone else answered, well, then you need to come to church because we, there's always room for one more. If we ran our business the way we conducted our obligations to the Lord, how would our business turn out? Would it prosper? How would our secular business prosper if we treated it like our spiritual business? Luke 16, 8, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. This comes from a controversial parable. And I would leave it to you to go back and study that parable in Luke chapter 16. Jesus is not condoning shrewd, illegal, cheating business practices, but he does make the point that some people figure ways of doing their business more carefully than they do figuring ways of doing their spiritual business. Let's look at four Old Testament examples that go along with our lesson today. Let's start with Lot's wife in Genesis chapter 19. Lot's wife began her escape from Sodom and Gomorrah, but she didn't keep her determination strong, and she looked back, and she turned to a pillar of salt. She failed to complete God's mission for her. What about the kind of trouble Daniel and his three friends had in Daniel 3 and, and Daniel 6? In Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. Because of God's blessing, they came out of it alive and unscathed. And in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel himself is thrown into the lion's den. And once again, he came out of he came out of there unhurt. They barely escaped. They scarcely escaped. It was through the determination of their belief in God and God's will that they did escape. A story we might not be quite as in tune with as the story of Lot's wife and Daniel and his three friends is the story of Jehoshaphat. Listen to this story, 2 Chronicles 18, 28 through 34. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you wear your robes. The king of Israel disguised himself and they went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of his chariots Fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. As soon as the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It's the king of Israel. So they turned to fight against him. Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. God drew them away from him, for as soon as the captains of the chariots saw it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. But a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. And the battle continued that day, 
and the king of Israel was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians until evening and then at sunset he died so Jehoshaphat lived long enough to see the evening and the conclusion of the battle then at sunset he died we all are going to reach a sunset in our lifetime and we can think we know when that might be but we don't know we don't know when illness might befall us we don't know when we might be involved in some type of storm flood fire traffic accident we don't know will we be able to remain faithful even to the very end a man that had a lot of trouble because he committed huge sins is King David but David exemplifies faith and trust we know the story David lust after Bathsheba David has gets her pregnant David murders her has her husband murdered and then he goes about taking her as one of his wives and of course they're going to have a baby and the baby was born ill and finally the baby passed away second Samuel 12 20 through 23 then David arose from the earth and washed himself and anointed himself and changed his clothes this is after he heard about the baby dying he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped and then he went into his own house and when he asked they set food before him and he ate and then the servants said to him what is this thing you have done you fasted and wept for the child while he was alive but when the child died you arose and ate food and, and David said while the child was still alive I fasted and wept for I said who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that that child may live but now he's dead why should I fast can I bring him back again I shall go to him but he will not return to me so it's with great effort that the righteous will be saved I think it's pretty clear what will become of the ungodly and the sinner the righteous is repaid on earth how much more the wicked and the sinner Proverbs 11 31 and what of 1st Corinthians 6 19 through 20 and 7 23 through 24 your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit you're not your own you were bought with a price let us remain with God So, if let us remain with God is Bible, that means a righteous person can turn away from his righteousness. He can leave it behind. In the Old Testament, we hear Ezekiel in his prophecy, chapter 18, verse 24, but when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live that's a rhetorical question the answer is no then Ezekiel says none of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed for them he shall die as Christians we must be diligent in the faith to show ourselves approved before God Paul told Timothy, the young preacher, in 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Of course, now we bring up another point that we're not going to take the time to discuss today, and that is, what makes one an approved worker for God? Well, I won't leave you hanging, totally. I'm going to put a link to an article I found on the website House to House and Heart to Heart. I'm going to put that in the description below. 
and I would suggest you go there and look at their very good study of what it means to show yourself approved unto God. Thank you for studying with me. As we've already said, we greatly appreciate your attendance to these videos. If you would like to, you could like this video, you could subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell, leave a comment, and share a link with someone you think would be interested in studying the New Testament, studying the Gospel of Christ, and talking about the things that we as Christians need to do while we're here on this earth. Lord willing, we'll be back in a few days with another video. Until then, may God bless.